seated. It's good to see everybody today. I, you can definitely tell it's a noon Chiefs game today. We had a, all of our Chiefs fans were here in first service today. But uh, hey, I want to tell you, thank well, I know we got a few in here. I'm not trying to insult anybody. I don't know we got some in here. Uh, thank you for, for being here today. It's great to, to worship with you. And hey, I, uh, I want you to turn to John 21. <clears throat> We're going to be in the last chapter of the Gospel of John. And, and um, <clears throat> excited to get into God's Word with you. I uh, appreciate all of the thoughts and prayers this last week as I was out of commission. I'll tell you what, um, not only did Pastor Tim do an amazing job on just a really short amount of time, short notice, but uh, our, our staff, I know Preston just texted our, our staff group chat, which really sounds official and sounds really great, but all it is is people sending memes to one another. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, Preston sending us things. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and he just said, you know what, we got this. And uh, as a person who was sick and, and wanted to be here, I, I knew they did. And uh, between them and our, our deacons and our volunteers, it was so great to know that uh, as I watched the FaceTime of the baptisms, I'll tell you what, you know I had to be sick if I missed baptism Sunday because that is, uh, man, that's such an exciting time. And uh, I, I just appreciate uh, our, our people, and, and I feel so blessed to get to serve with with this group, but I'm feeling better, and I'm excited to get into God's Word. I want to I want to hop right on into John 21, starting in verse one. I want to read through actually verse um, verse 15, 15 through 19. I want to read through this passage, and then I want to pray and ask God to to lead us in the the understanding of His Word today. But I I believe that this is going to speak to exactly the same things that we've been been talking about already. So read with me in in John chapter 21, starting in verse 15. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old... You will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you to where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you would just supernaturally um, equip us to understand your word. I believe that you have a message for each and every one of us today, regardless of what we have come in here with. And Lord, I pray that you would just, uh, through the, the working of your Holy Spirit, equip us to understand, equip us to, to put it into our hearts and to, to make changes to our lives. And Father, I pray that you would speak through your word to your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So just as Jamie mentioned... We're going to focus on, on Peter today, but uh, we're going to focus on an aspect of Peter's life that I think we can all uh, agree with. I think that we can all um, understand. I, as you know, I spent uh, about 13 years in, in the classroom, and I want to take you back to middle school. For some of you guys, this may be, uh, no, you don't want to go to middle school? You're like, uh, for some of us, this may take us, I might, I might trigger you a little bit here, but uh, we're going back to middle school. Imagine you've, you've put your work and your heart and your soul into something, you, you, you finish it up, it's always like 12 o'clock the night before it's due, right? You, you take it into class and you, you type it up nice and pretty and then you hand this to your, your teacher. And there's going to come a time when, when the teacher is walking in the front of the room and, and is passing these things back. And, and as you know, 
as you probably experienced, this thing equals like death, right? <laughs> um, you know to already be looking for stuff that's circled and underlined and all scratched up. And, and many of us know what it feels like to, to finally get our paper back and see this, right? For me, this was more likely to happen in algebra and geometry than it was for language arts. But, but we know what, what this is, and, and if you're not up front, what, what, what's on there, guys, up close? F. F, what's that stand for? Failure. Failure. Now, we all know what it looks like in life to experience failure, right? Failure comes in, in a lot of different forms, in a lot of different uh, uh, examples. And Peter knew what it felt like to fail. Peter had, had, had promised Jesus as, as his disciple, I'll, I'll follow you wherever you call me to. If, if the rest of these yahoos, if they abandon you, I never will, Jesus. I will go with you wherever you call me to go. And, and Jesus says, by the time the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times, which is exactly what took place. Peter feels like a big, giant failure. Some of us can, can uh, really appreciate that feeling. We all know what it feels like to, to blow it. But the question that we, uh, we have to ask ourselves is, what do we do then? What do we do next? How do we respond? How, maybe your, your failure is something in which you say, how could God still love me after blank? I believe that's where Jesus was, at that, or at, where Peter was at that point. There's lots of, of places you and I can experience failure. For, for some of us, maybe it was a class. Maybe it was just about the example that, that I shared. Maybe it was a, uh, something in school. For, for some of us, we know what it feels like to have a career, career failure. We, we stepped out in something. It was a job. It was an endeavor. And we fall flat on our face. And, and we, we find ourselves dusting ourselves off going, how am I ever going to recover from this? Maybe it was a, a relationship. Have you ever been rejected in a relationship? Have you ever uh, had someone just completely uh, turn their back on you? Maybe for some of us, it's, it's a very real uh, thing to where we say, my, my, my marriage ended in failure. My marriage ended in divorce. How do I pick up the pieces after that? Can God still love me and use me after that? The answer is, of course, yes. Maybe for some of us, our, our failure has been in the form of of continuing to fall back into a pattern of sinful behavior where we say, I, I, I'm striving after the gospel. And, and maybe in, in our flesh we say, I know, what, I know what Jesus has called me to do. I'm going to try it really hard this time. I'm going to cut this out of my life. I'm going to be obedient to Christ. And, and in our own strength we step out and we're, we're chasing after him only to, to blow it. Maybe for, like Peter, we blow it in a, in a really public way. Maybe other people know it. They see it. It's not secret. It's, it's front page news. Maybe for some of us, we, we just feel defeated that we continue to fall back into these, these patterns of disobedience and sin. And here's what I want you to know. We're going to talk about today the fact that regardless of of which of those things you associate with. Let's just be honest. Let's be real. Every single one of us knows what it's like to fail, right? And in fact, one of the things, kids, I'm so glad we have this youth section up here. I'm going to promise you, we, we teach kids to, to just be terrified of failure. You are going to fail at something, all right? I'm not giving you permission to, like, <laughs> not do your homework tomorrow, but you will fail. The question is not if we fail, the question is, what are we going to do when we fail? How will we respond? That's where we learn. And here's the beautiful thing about the gospel is Jesus is drawn to our weakness, right? In fact, in our weakness, is just as Paul talked about, that in our weakness, that's when we're strong because we cry out to our Savior. In fact, if it weren't for our failure, many of us would never realize just how desperately we need a Savior. And so Peter, after the cross, is going, I am a failure. I'm always going to be a failure. Nothing will ever change that. And then Jesus comes upon the scene. Isn't that a great story? 
Isn't that a great testimony? To come to a point where we say, I, I'm hopeless, but Jesus. Let's look at the proposition statement for today. I want to encourage anyone who has ever failed in the past to see that the final chapter of your life is yet to be written. And that goes for every single one of us in here. God can use our past shortcomings to shape us into the image of his son. It doesn't say God can use your past shortcomings if you've got any. Because again, we all do. The people that look really shiny and put together and, and real like on point next to you, they've blown it. So have you, so have I. Let's just stop with that illusion of perfection, okay? Let's give each other the grace that we so desperately need. All of us knows what it's like to have blown it. But God can use our past shortcomings to shape us into the image of his son. And I love this passage. It really hasn't been that long since I've teached on this. Since I, I taught English. <laughs> Second service, you never know what you're going to get. I was an English teacher. It has not been that long since we have taught on this, okay? <laughs> Robert, we're going to need to edit that out, okay? <laughs> Just <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm just going to blame the pneumonia, all right? I'm still. <laughs> all right, so we, we, we haven't, it's not that been some, that long since we, we taught of this and we've talked about this, but, but this was in the, the passage this week, and so I, I think it's powerful, and I think that we can, we can all gain something from this today. And the first point I want us to see is that every one of us has failures. Every one of us has failures. John's gospel is so cool because John, if you're familiar with the, you know, the four gospels, John gives us a whole lot of brand new content. He gives us a lot of material that we don't see in any of the, of the other gospels. John gives us a lot of glimpses into Jesus's, his humanity. We get to see the heart of Christ. And John includes this beautiful chapter in chapter 21 because I'm going to be honest Chapter 20 is a really great ending. Let me re read the end of chapter 20 to you. And, and, and here's what John says at the end of, of, of John 20. The disciples saw Jesus do many other mirac miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Now, in English, I will tell you, it's all about that final summary statement. John has wrapped it up in a nice, neat bow. That's perfection. That's beautiful. It's divinely inspired. The temptation must have been to stop right there. But if you think about this, we're getting ready to go into the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit descend upon this group of believers who are, are praying and seeking the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is going to come in power. And then we see... Peter the failure turned into Peter the preacher. And Peter, who's, who's empowered by the Spirit, and he speaks truth, and it cuts to the heart, and people are saved. And you might go, well, what in the world happened where we see Peter the failure become Peter the prophet, right? Peter the preacher, Peter the, the powerful instrument of God. That's why we need chapter 21. Because there is a great act of redemption, of healing that takes place in chapter 20. And it is beautiful. Let's look at verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Sea of Tiberias, another word for the Sea of what, guys? Galilee. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee... Zebedee's sons and two others of his disciples were together. So this isn't all of the disciples are, are gathered together. And what do they do in church? They are, they're fishing. Verse 3, I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We are coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. A couple of truths I want us to see here. First of all, Peter... I believe, is a natural leader. We see that. We, we see that for whatever reason, the other disciples, they tend to follow after this guy. They listen to Peter. Peter has some natural giftedness and leadership. And we see this often. He's, 
he's outspoken, he's willing to speak his mind, he's, he's willing to even look foolish at times because he speaks sometimes without thinking, he's, he's the one who will jump into a situation. That's, that's leadership, and that's a really great thing, but how many of us know that there's also a shadow side to that, right? Peter also says things that are stupid <laughs> a lot of times. He also, in his impulsiveness, he will get himself into trouble. And sometimes he, his, his mouth will cash checks that his, or write checks that his rear end cannot cash, right? <laughs> Some of us are going, you're a Peter, honey, right? <laughs> that, that can happen. So that's, that's a very reality. And then we're going to see John. John, by, by contrast, is a very different disciple. They had a, a really great rivalry. But, but notice... Peter says, Jesus is gone. We've been called. Jesus told them to go to Galilee. And so they've gone back to Galilee. But Jesus did not tell them to fish. Peter says, let's, let's go out into the boat. That was not something that, that Peter was instructed to do. Well, then why do they do it? Some will say that Peter's being blatantly disobedient. Some will say, well, they're just trying to feed themselves. I think that, that Peter, in a time of uncertainty, goes back to what's familiar. Would you guys agree with that? That's a really dangerous temptation when we've, when we've blown it. A lot of times, kids, I promise I'm not going to focus on you the whole time. Here's a little piece of advice. When you blow it, don't go back to the familiar. Don't go back to what's comfortable. Don't go back to uh, sometimes the, the, the circumstances, the people, the crowd, the, the things that, that you've been delivered from. Peter goes back to what's comfortable. And, and notice he's outside of the will of God. And so it says that night they did what? They caught nothing. Don't expect to experience, you know, all of this grace and all of these blessings when we're outside of the will of God, church. Verse 4, when daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them. You don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat. He told them, and you will find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. Now, does this sound familiar? We've already seen this. Again, Jesus is taking Peter back to, to the very beginning, but this is somehow different. It's, it's dark. The sun is just coming up. They don't recognize or don't. It's too dark to discern that it's Jesus on the shore, but there's something so cool. This is the the, the post-incarnate Jesus, right? There's something that's, that's very different. Jesus has, has died. He's, he's got his, his resurrected body, and something is, is different about that. We see that he still has scars, right? He's going to show Thomas his, his scars. But there's something different and wonderful about Jesus, and he's returned in order to do something. There's unfinished business, and so he's going to bring them back to the familiar. He's going to remind them of something that happened much earlier when he, when he called out to them, when he told them to, to drop their nets and follow him in the very, very beginning. Sometimes Jesus will, will bring us back to, to something in our past so he can redeem it in order to make it work uh, and, and bless our future. Verse 7, the disciple. The one Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Notice, who is this guy, the one Jesus loved? John. I love that. John's just giving himself his own little nickname here in his gospel. <laughs> the one that Jesus loved, right? John had some pride himself there, and, and he was a great man. But, but notice John says, it is the Lord. I believe that maybe John had, had a little bit more of a... A sensitivity to spiritual things. He senses that this is Jesus. Peter, although he's brash and he jumps into things, sometimes he's not as quick to be perceptive of, of things. And so, but I love this about Peter. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off and plunged into the sea. There was Jesus, the one whom he had let down, the one he had hurt. But when he saw his Savior, he throws caution to the wind, and he just goes. He just takes off. That's the kind of heart we need to have when we return to our Savior. Amen? When we've blown it, when we, when we know that we need grace, there's nothing that is going to hold Peter back. These, this, same, same, this same desire is what made Peter a leader. Verse 9, 
When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. There's one other place in God's word that it talks about a charcoal fire. Anybody know where it might be? It's when the same night, the same evening before the crucifixion when, when Peter denied Christ. Do you remember that? There was a fire there in the courtyard outside of Caiaphas' house. And, and, and this girl says, you're one of his followers, aren't you? You're a Galilean. And, and Peter says, I don't, I don't know that man. Again, we see. Do you think that that's a coincidence that Jesus has made a charcoal fire? And he's done this in order to, to talk to Peter. He's bringing him back to that moment of failure. He's bringing him back to the moment when, when everything fell apart. Why? So that he can redeem. So that he can repair. So that he can bring about a, a healing and a restoration. And so the charcoal fire is here. And I love this about Jesus too. Jesus is cooking breakfast on the seashore. He, did you know that Jesus is even concerned about your physical needs? Isn't that just like our Savior? Jesus cares about the fact that his disciples were, were hungry. And there's this, this servanthood of what Jesus is doing here. The fish lying on it and bread, verse 10. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Um, I have no idea why it gives us the number there. I don't believe there's anything significant in the number 153. Maybe there is. But uh, I think, you know what? I think we're supposed to just realize they caught a lot of fish. When they were obedient to what Jesus commanded them to do, they experienced abundance. Verse 12, come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. Again, I believe, just to make things abundantly clear to his disciples, he's, he's taking bread and he's breaking it and he's distributing it. We see this on the strangers, the, the, the guys on the road to Emmaus. They realized it was Jesus when he starts to break the bread. He's, he's bringing them back to that night when he had them gathered in the upper room. He doesn't want there to be any, any confusion. He's, he's giving them a complete and total reset of their moment of failure. And so, verse 14, this was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So Peter, we, we know from the other Gospels, he's already seen Jesus, but he's seeing him again. Peter denied the Lord. Peter failed publicly. Anybody know what it feels like to fail publicly? That's even worse than failing privately. Did you know that? And so Peter is going to get an opportunity to be restored publicly in front of these other men. Peter's going to have an opportunity to, to, to be redeemed by Jesus in this moment. And so the first thing that we realized in, in, our, in our outline is that every one of us has experienced failure. And the next one is every one of us needs forgiveness. Every one of us needs forgiveness. Jesus tracks down Peter. He's reminding him of the very first time when they met. He's, he's reminding him of the joy of that first moment of their meeting. Here's my question for you. Many of us have, have said, I'll, I'll give the Jesus thing a try. You know, I, I, it's worth a shot. I, I've got this circumstance, this situation. I'll pray for it. I'll surrender it. But when Jesus doesn't come through in the way that we see fit or in the way that we deem would be appropriate or we don't experience the blessing on our time frame, many of us will say, I, I'm done. I, 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 I'm questioning. The, 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 my, my faith is lacking. Or I, I gave it a try. It didn't work out in the way that I want. And here Jesus has tracked down Peter. And he's reminding him of this very first time. And we're going to see what Jesus calls him to. We're going to see that uh, Peter is doing what many of us do when we don't experience what we think we should experience. He's gone back to what's, what's comfortable. He's gone back to fishing because he doesn't feel worthy to be recognized or used anymore. Jesus wants to restore Peter, but he's got to bring him back to these circumstances. He's got to face his failure. Can I tell you, 
God doesn't want us to hide our failure. Can I tell you some of the most powerful testimonies I've experienced from people, from pastors, from, from, from men and women who love Jesus are the ones who say, I have blown it. <laughs> I've been redeemed. I've, I've made a mess of things on my own. And, and, and Jesus met me in that pit. And he brought me out. That is what J Jesus is going to do for Peter. He's going to find him here. He's going to bring him back and make him useful again. But he, he's not just going to turn the page on that failure. He says, Peter, we're going to walk right through this whole thing. We're going to deal with it. We're going to work through it. I'm going to bring you right to the very verge of, of where you left me. And I'm going to give you another opportunity. Here's the second thing. Every one of us needs forgiveness. Look at verse 15. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him. Now, a couple things. Jesus asks Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, what is Simon's new name, guys? Peter. Who gave him that name? Jesus. Again, Jesus is going back to an earlier time, the time before Simon was, before Peter was called, and he's saying, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, what we miss in our English translation here is there's something much deeper than, than what we can see. The original language is, is, is love meaning agape, the highest order of love, a, a godly type of love, love that is, that is full of sacrifice. It's, it's love that's full of obedience. It's a, it's a, it's a godly love. It's the perfect self-sacrificing love. And, and he says... Do you love me, agape, more than these? Now, here's a couple questions, a couple ways to interpret this. Number one, Peter was the one who said, these jokers are all going to leave you, but I will stay by your side, Jesus. It could be that Jesus is saying, hey, do you love me more than these guys still? Right? But here's another op option, and I think this one makes more sense. What are they surrounded by at this very moment? Fish? Nets? A boat? The sea, Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me, agape, more than, than fishing? Do you love me more than, than this, this thing, this way of, of life? Do you love me more than, than this, this past pursuit? Do you love me more than, than anything else? You fill in the blank, what is, whatever it is that, that competes with our agape love for the Lord, Jesus is saying, do you love me more than this? Church, men, I'm going to pick on you for a moment, a moment. I hope it's okay. Guys, the church is desperately in need of some men to stand up and really love. Show what it looks like to love Jesus. We get real nervous when it comes to church. And churches are not good at drawing men. You know why? We say, sit down, be quiet, sing songs, and let's get together and talk about our feelings. How many guys enjoy that? That's terrible. Let's make you sit in some pastel room with like, you know, and, and let's, let's just share our hearts, okay? That's awful, right? No guy wants to do that. But here's something beautiful. Love is not Valentine's Day love, okay? Here's what we're talking about. Do you love football? Yeah. And you're not ashamed to say that, are you? Do you love a good steak? Yes. <laughs> Jesus is saying, you rave about all of these things, the things that you're passionate about, the things that you will, do, do you love your family? Guys will say, absolutely. Well, how, do, how will be the evidence that you love your family? I, I sacrifice for them. I work my tail off. I, 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 I give them the things that they, that they require. I sacrifice. I'm, I'm obedient. I, I, I show, I demonstrate my love. And Jesus is saying, do you love me in a way that makes this love for fishing and any other thing that you could fill in the blank? Do you love me in a way that it pales in comparison to your, your agape love for me? That's a hard question, isn't it? Because, guys, we are all about other things in our lives. And, ladies, I know you all are, are the same way. I'm just not going to pick on you today. Come back next week, right? <laughs> We know what it is like to, to be crazy about things, to rave about things, to love things. And Jesus is saying, do you love me, agape, more than, than these? 
And Peter's response is this, yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you, but he uses a lower form of love. He uses the word phileo, which means it's a brotherly love. It's, it's like I really, really like you, Jesus. Now, why is that? Why does he not go for the gusto? Why does he not say, Jesus, I agape you? And it's because Peter still remembers he's a failure. The last time he spoke on those kind of terms, he blew it. And so there's a little bit of sheepishness in Peter, and that's okay. Peter says, you know that I phileo you. And, and Jesus says, feed my lambs. He says, Peter, I don't want you to go back to fishing. Here's what I'm calling you to do, Peter. You're going to take care of my sheep. You're going to feed my sheep. Now, what does that mean? How do you, who are, well, first of all, who are the lambs, church? We are. God's people. God's people are lambs. How do you feed God's people? How does a, a teacher, a pastor, a leader feed God's people? What's the food that we talk about? And that men will live not on bread alone, but by every word of, of the Lord that comes from God. And so when, as a pastor, Peter's going to be challenged to, to feed his flock on the words of God. That's important. There's an important part of, uh, of, of pastoring that is teaching and pointing to the word. And then in verse 16, a second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him. Again, Jesus uses agape. You know that I, Peter says again, phileo. I really, really like you, Jesus. And Jesus says, shepherd my sheep. How many of us know that the calling of pastoral work is, is, is something, and, and every time I talk about this, it sounds weird, like it's focused. I don't ever want the focus to be on, on the pastoral staff, but, but there's more to pastoral work than just teaching, right? There's a lot of men who will go, I'm all about, I want to sit in, or stand in front of a group of people and talk because I love it when people listen to me talk. Guess what? There's more to it. In fact, if this is what you're passionate about, the chances are you're not as passionate about the soul care that's absolutely vital in what he's talking about here. He's saying, shepherd my sheep. The, the pastor doesn't just feed them. He also takes care of them when they're hurt and when they're broken. He, he, he tends to their wounds. He walks with them in the, the dark places. He makes sure that they're safe. There's a, a part of pastoral care that's so much greater. In fact, Jesus says the pastor must lay down his life for his sheep if necessary. He says, do you love me like that? And notice something that I don't know that I ever really paid attention to up to this point. Here's the great task that's been given to Peter. Shepherd whose sheep? My sheep. Guys, y'all belong to Jesus, right? He says, I'm entrusting you to something very, very powerful and very important, but don't get it confused. You belong to Christ. They're my sheep. You just get to care for them for a while. And there's a danger here because a lot of times we see in the New Testament, the epistles, like some associate with Paul and some Apollos and they become followers of a man. And this was humbling for me. Like Jesus is saying, I'll sort all that stuff out. Just be faithful to the people that I've entrusted to you because they're not yours. Just be faithful. Teach the word. That's what we want to do as, as pastors is to care for and, and, and give an account for how we shepherded the flock. But always, always, always with the understanding that the flock belongs to Christ. Amen. Verse 17, he asks him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This time Jesus drops it down to phileo. He's meeting, Jesus drops it down to, to phileo. He's meeting Peter right where he is. Peter, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time. Why? How many times did Peter deny Christ? Three. Three. Jesus is going to ask him three times. Again, this is reset. This is a new beginning. This is a fresh start. If you need a new beginning, a fresh start, a reset, Jesus will give it to you, church. That's what he's doing right here. He doesn't view Simon Peter and say, you're too broken. You're too unworthy for me to use anymore. He says, do you love me? And Peter's hurt. He says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Does Peter love Jesus? Yes. He says, you know it. Church, that same question is asked of us. 
Remember, love looks like obedience. It looks like sacrifice. It looks like service. Do you, Jesus is asking, he could be asking you, he is asking you, do you love me? What's the evidence of that love? Here's the kicker. Jesus knows the answer. Right? He knows where our devotion is. He knows where our passions are. He knows where our allegiance is. He knows that sometimes we'll say one thing and do something completely different. And here he says, feed my sheep. What's Jesus calling Peter to do? Lay down his life. He's saying, you're not a fisherman anymore, Peter. You're, you're a pastor. Not only do you get a reset, not only are you forgiven, not only are you restored, I want to use you to build my church. I want to use broken, old, messed up, prideful, stubborn Peter as a vessel so that I can extend grace to broken, other broken people. You know who's great at reaching broken people? Broken people who have been saved by a perfect God, right? He says, I want to use you. You know everything. You know that I love you. Here's the last thing. Every one of us has a future. That includes you. That includes me. Every one of us has a future. Verse 18, truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. I'm going to bring up this point first. What were the first words that Jesus said to, to Peter on the shores of Galilee? Right? His commission was to follow me. It's bringing him right back to the very beginning. And then he says, Peter, there's going to come a time when the end of your story is going to be the same as my earthly story. The journey that you're going to take in leading people to Christ, it's going to end right there. The ladies this week said, hey, Mark, we don't have anybody to carry the cross out of here. Can we just leave it up? I said, I guess I can work it in somehow to the message, right? <laughs> How appropriate. Jesus says, this is the end of the road for you, Peter. And you would think that Peter would go, oh, no, what have I done? I've, I, I'm going back to the boat, right? That's not, that's not how I want my story to end. That's not what I want to, to, to culminate my life. And Jesus says, Peter, you're going to be hung on a cross. Someone else will take your life from you. And Peter, instead of recoiling from that, you know what he does? I love this about Peter. He's Jesus says, follow me. You know what Peter does? He follows. I believe Peter's heart was filled with, with joy. You know why? Peter was a what, guys? He was a, he was a failure. And Jesus says, you're never going to fail me again. You will be obedient. You will be faithful all the way to the cross. And that's the only way I'm going to get glory out of your life. Jesus' call is clear, guys. Don't believe this nonsense that tells you that <laughs> you come to Jesus for health and wealth and fame and glory and all these lies. You know what you should come to Jesus for? More of Jesus, right? That's all it takes. Jesus doesn't say, come to me and I will make you wealthy. He says, you are going to end up giving your life on a cross. Here's our walking point. If we encourage young soldiers to go to war, but at the same time discourage young believers from going to the mission field, we've misunderstood the gospel. Church, Jesus says, follow me. He says, if anyone wants to save his life, he'll lose it. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. I love to see baptisms, and I love to see people coming to Christ. And just as Pastor Tim talked about, that's the, that's the starting gun. That's not the finish line, right? What I hope to see as we continue to, to plant ourselves here, invest our lives in this community, is that we would see that the mission of the church should not exist in this room. The mission of the church is to go out, and maybe the mission field for you is your neighbor's house. Maybe it's your family member. Maybe it's to go to Guatemala or Africa. Maybe for some of us, 
you know how I'll know that, that God has his hand on this church? When we start planting some other churches by people who are saying, I'm called out to go into ministry to give my life in humble service to the Lord, even if that means I pack up everything and go. That's when God is working and moving in a congregation. Amen? When we don't see our lives as our own anymore. It's not about being comfortable. I'm going to close with this word, these words. Tim preached on them several weeks ago. John 16 says this. When Jesus said, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. What were Jesus' last words to Peter? Follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Church, it's the same commission that it's always been. Do you love me? Do you love me? Love looks like obedience. It looks like sacrifice. It looks like service. It looks like following Jesus regardless of where he leads us. Let's pray.